give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever. Fight forever and ever and ever and ever. Wrestling fans, we are back with another edition of the Shoot Interview Series. This is Michael with HighSpots.com, on site at Wrestle Reunion 2. We are here with Memphis announcing legend, Mr. Lance Russell. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, Mr. Russell. Thank you, Michael. We appreciate it. We well, want to first start off by uh, thanking Mr. Russell being flexible with the schedule. A lot of people that are just watching these interviews just take them for granted. Uh, we're starting this one at. One o'clock in the morning, and Mr. Russell's going to be on a plane <laughs> in about seven hours. So, yeah. Uh, we, do, we do sincerely appreciate the time you're going to take out with us tonight and share, share some of I appreciate you asking me, Michael. I really do. Well, Mr. Russell, we always ask, uh, the first question is, how does somebody get started in the wrestling business? We want to know how, how, uh, how you began in the wrestling business. I was uh, working at a television station in Jackson, Tennessee, which is about 85 miles northeast of Memphis. And uh, as it turned out, uh, I, I was doing sports, all sports. I did high school sports and, and uh, two colleges that were located, smaller colleges that were located in Jackson. I did basketball, football, all that sort of thing, boxing and all. And one day the manager of the station uh, said, hey, Lance, we're going to start a live wrestling show here. And I just wondered, uh, have you ever done any wrestling? And I said, no, but I was a wrestling fan up in Dayton, Ohio, and there's no reason why I shouldn't be able to do it because I sure loved it enough. And we started doing live wrestling right there from the studios, and that's how I got into it. Tell us uh, what the public perception was of wrestling when you began. Well, it, it was, of course, a lot of years ago, uh, and uh, the public perception of it was that we had, we have ardent fans today, but we had, there was not nearly the conversation about, there was always, oh, is it real or is it fake or something like that, but it uh, was nothing like the 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 hoorah that started about it and and finally um, with the w, I guess the turning point was when the WWF went to the uh, wrestling commission and said hey we are sports entertainment and it is not a real sport and they avoided the taxes which hey that's the name of the game and uh, from that changed the concept of it and the fans started looking at it at it differently, I think, Michael. I have to tell you that this day and time where there's open conversation about wrestling and all that aspect of it, that um, the, the fans, some of them, will say, I wish the, that it was the way it was. And it's kind of interesting to me because uh, they take such an absolute straight out from the heart, and I mean that, uh, look at wrestling. They enjoyed it more when there wasn't all of the conversation. At least that's the impression that I get from some of the fans that I talk to. And I know a lot of people that have been in the business uh, for, for a lot of years, and we ask them to do these interviews, that a lot of times they're uncomfortable talking about it because they grew up through, a, through an era of not... not I'm uncomfortable to talking about it. Sure. I honestly am. A and uh, it, you still, I mean, it just doesn't seem right. It's just not the way that it should be. <laughs> I, uh, I want to know is how long was it until you realized uh, what wrestling was? I mean, because I'm guessing when you came in. Years, it, years. Because when I came into it, the promoters never took you into their confidence. People say, well, you know, they'd have been a lot better off if they'd have talked to you and all of this kind of thing. They didn't believe that. And I'm not really sure that that's true. Um, it's still... I, I think most people that would be doing commentary on it and, and, 
and covering the action part of it and all, they benefit from not knowing anything about what they're about to see or anything like that, and it just comes to them spontaneously out of the blue. And um, the best way to do that is just to have it like any good old high school Friday night football game and have it come to you right out of the blue. I mean, I really believe that. Uh, after a while, you know, if you love it and if you really are, are into it, I think that it, uh, it, you will be able to go and, and do it. I do now. I just, you know, what we did tonight, I, I get so excited. I got so emotional at the Steve Williams situation coming back after the bout with cancer and uh, all the wrestling fans, I think, know about all of the things that Dr. Death uh, went through. And to come back, he said he was going to, and a lot of people said he'll never do it. It was about as emotional as I've been in around any sporting event, anywhere, anytime. You mentioned that you were a wrestling fan when you were a youngster growing up in yes. Ohio. Yes. Tell us about some of the memories of uh, you being a fan of wrestling. Michael, this is a cheap way out, but I'm going to tell you the honest truth. That is so long ago. I remember some instances in, in Dayton, Ohio, where I went to matches and all, but I really don't remember the names and all. I, I think probably. Now, I could be wrong. There may be somebody somewhere, and if this sounds like bragging, so be it, because I love the fact that the good Lord has let me hang around this long that I am the oldest living representative in wrestling uh, in the world, to the best of my knowledge. My, my good friend Gordon Soley, uh, Gordon and I not only worked together when we were with WCW, but uh, we had been friends before that. We were friends long distance because uh, when, the, when there used to be wrestlers working the Florida Territory that were coming up to the Memphis, Tennessee Territory, which, um, which is where I was, and, and, and I would ask Gordon, would you do an interview with somebody and, and send it up for us, you know, prior to, like three or four weeks before they were ever coming into the Territory, and, and we traded interviews like that, and we had some that were going back down and, and to the Florida Territory, and we would do interviews there in Sun Down. So we were good friends, but I mentioned Gordon because we used to talk about it all the time, and Gordon couldn't believe it when I was in it three years longer than he was. Oh, wow. So you, were, <laughs> yeah. you started before Gordon Soli. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, before Gordon Soli. That's of, correct. A lot yeah. of people wouldn't know that. Huh? Yeah. Well, it, uh, it's a long time ago, and I'm very, very blessed to have been able to experience that much time in it. Being you had no, uh, you, you weren't you weren't a wrestler at one time and that became no. a no. commentator. No, do I look like a wrestler? <laughs> so who who influenced your style and and, uh, and who did you look to for I guess maybe just advice or uh, you just mimicked in some way that you said well I like what they do, let me take some elements of this and, and put it to my trade. Boy, I don't know. At the risk of sounding conceited, and I don't mean it in that way at all because it's not certainly that I was too good to be able to do anything that anybody else did or take uh, take anything from anybody else but it it just kind of came to me it's the way I did uh, basketball and boxing um, uh, boxing was more difficult to do really than wrestling because of the rapidity uh, it's when you get going in a series of holds they're sometimes pretty fast, but when you get two guys who are exchanging punches, they really are coming fast, and you had to learn some of the tricks of how to, how to get all of the punches or the important part of the punches in. Uh, but most of it was, it was just like doing, and I guess I was hanging around high school football and broadcasting so much, and all of the enthusiasm that came out in those school games and all, and it just kind of evolved. I, I, don't, I don't know a better answer than that. That's just really the way I, I feel like that it happened. I didn't have anybody that, that I had listened to. Certainly nobody alive today. <laughs> and, you, and once you, you know, everybody that's watching this interview, I don't want to say everybody, but most people watching this interview know you only as a wrestling announcer. 
but or a wrestling commentator, but you did high school football, you did these boxings. Do, yeah. do you actually have a favorite? Is wrestling a favorite of yours, or do you prefer football? Or? Oh, I don't, I, don't, I don't think there's any question that wrestling is a favorite of mine because I've, I've, I've spent more time with it. I've had a chance to get closer to it in, in knowing it and, and that, and I, in, I don't have any hesitation about saying yes. I like all sports, love golf. Love golf. I mean, what else? When you get to be my age, what are you going to do? You're not going to be wrestling, playing basketball. Did that. <laughs> Can't do it anymore. So you, you, you do a lot of golf down in Florida now? Uh, not nearly as much as I would like to. Part of it is probably restricted because of uh, uh, the age and some of the ailments that you pick up and that sort of thing that you can't do it as much. Uh, but I do, I do play more than probably the average person does. I try to average at least once a week. It doesn't always happen that way, but I play about that much. Very good. Well, you know, everybody knows you as the voice of Memphis wrestling, so I uh, wanted to start talking about some, some of the things that we've seen as fans in Memphis, and maybe you can add on to those memories and some of your memories. And, we'll uh, try to. Sure. Well, there, there's some, uh, probably when I think about the, uh, some of the more famous angles that, that people today remember. Uh, I want to start with the, the Tupelo bar fight. Yeah, maybe that was. Yeah. I mean, I got to tell you, it has been tried to be duplicated, and on a couple of occasions, and in, in at least a couple of different promotions that I know of, and even when they tried to redo it in Memphis. It just didn't come out the same because it was contrary to what most people think about it. They think that, you know, oh, it's all planned out, and Jerry Lawler gab grabbed that big gallon jug of mustard and, and threw it at the honky-tonk man and just missed his head about that far and hit the wall and made a huge dent in the wall. That was all planned and worked out. No. These guys, <laughs> they were, I thought they were going to kill each other. I really did. And, and, and when we, it started to happen, we, you'd have to know the facilities. We were upstairs on a little wooden platform that built to film, if you, I mean tape, if you can believe that, the uh, matches that were taking place in Tupelo, and we edited them in the camera, Michael, and... We delivered that tape to a station that night at between 12 and 1 o'clock, sometimes as late as 2 o'clock, to be played the next day at like 11 or 12 o'clock, I don't remember exactly, uh, on the Saturday the next day. So it, it was kind of fun television, to say the very least. Well, what happened is this fight broke out down below us and there were stairs coming down and rickety all of it was rickety and and so i grabbed the microphone cable and i said come on come on come on and and, and we went started going down the stairs to see if i could see what was happening and that's really what we thought would happen i'd be able to do audio and describe it like i was i was doing a radio uh, situation well, we got down where the camera could get down to it, and we still, we didn't lose power and all that kind of stuff. And we got down there, and we were in the middle of the dad gummedest fight you ever saw going down. Now, I mean, I've been around a lot of them, but I'm telling you, this was a stem winder and a half. And, and from the stuff of like Lawler throwing that mustard right at the honky-tonk man and, and, and just barely missed his head with it, the whole thing was just, just a wild one. And that, that is the way the Tupelo concession stand came about. And the first thing you know, uh, we, we, <laughs> we delivered it and, and had the tape and, and, uh, for it, and, and sure enough, it came out to be a real fan gym. I mean, they really liked that. I think, I think everybody got into They felt just what we felt looking at it live as it developed right there. Does that make any sense? That's the way it I happened. Mean, can, you, can you usually tell when you hit a home run with something right away? Yeah, most of the time. Now, you know, I, that's uh, probably foolish to say that and sounds, well, anyhow, the answer is yeah. Generally, you, 
there's certain ones that you don't. Sometimes they don't come off the way you think they come off. They don't look just exactly the way they look in your eyes, and they, they turn out not to be as good as it. And then again, uh, they turn out sometimes to be better. It's like the Tupelo concession stand. And I swear to you, with, knowing all about what happened in the first Tupelo concession stand, we tried to duplicate it and could not do it. I mean, it just didn't happen. That's all there was to it. Mm -hmm. is, that the, is that the one angle you think you probably get asked more about today than any other? I would think so. There were in, a, there is another one where Jerry Lawler and Sam Bass, Jerry's manager at that time, um, uh, ripped my suit off. And they got, that, was, that was the dadgumdest thing in the world. You know, I've heard about them going through there and, and cutting seams and all that kind of stuff. No. I mean, it was a deal. you you got to understand the personality of Lawler and Bass. They had a diabolical sense of humor, and Sam to his dying day, and Jerry Lawler still. And uh, somebody tonight was telling me about Lawler. Um, I can't remember exactly where it was. Uh, it was saying... Oh, facing the camera, and they and he said, "Okay, you just walk out through these curtains, the new young wrestlers, you know." And they'd walk out, and the camera would be right in their face, <laughs> and they were expecting it to be all the way across the studio or something like that. That's the kind of sense of humor, like a broken leg. What a funny thing that is! But um, it's just just the kind of kind of way that it that it was, and. Uh, I, I, I don't know anything I do, to answer was that. The, that. Yeah. And, I, and I'm sorry because I'm certainly not an expert on, on Memphis wrestling. Yeah. Was that, was oh, that, what I was telling yeah. you was the suit. Yes. That was the suit deal. When Sam reached out on one side and ripped that thing off, and I mean, they pulled it, and the, in the suit, it was just exactly like you're taking a pair of scissors and cut it just, it just split it in half like that, and there I'm standing, and, and here's my suit. I will say the promotion did buy me a new suit. <laughs> <laughs> did you, on something like that, did you uh, have advanced knowledge that they were no. going to involve you? No. No? Uh -uh. So you just kind of have to react. Just, hey, you went with the flow, and that's the way it was. And, and there was never any, and particularly in the earlier days before uh, uh, Jerry Jarrett took over the booking and so on, um, uh, Roy Welch, and Nick Goulas were the owners of the business, and boy, they wouldn't be caught dead talking to uh, a talent about anything, you know, about wrestling. And, and so it was just totally, and I did just found out one thing. It was kind of fun. I mean, you know, I enjoyed that mm -hmm. uh, because it was not actually my job. It, it was part of my job, but I did it as kind of a... Uh, a hobby and then uh, voca avocation uh, as, a, as a sideline because I was director of programming for RKO General down there in Memphis, and that's what my real job was. And so I loved wrestling and enjoyed doing it, and I think that, you know, that's got to help in anything you're doing, whether you're doing interviews or whether you're whatever you're doing, it, it helps you out. Who, when you started as a commentator, who... Who was doing the booking of, uh, of Memphis Wrestling? Memphis Wrestling was, to the best of my knowledge, it was, I was going to say Roy Welch, but that, that doesn't sound right. Do you know, I honestly, if it wasn't Roy, I don't, I don't really remember. What people remember about Memphis wrestling typically be the, the wild and crazy yeah. angles. That, but it wasn't so crazy when, when, uh, before Mr. Jarrett. That's right. Jerry, he infused that wrestling with it. I mean, he really brought in some, some great ideas, and, and he just kind of let a lot of, um, a lot of personality things develop within the wrestling, and that's what made it uh, go wild and wasn't afraid to try anything. Now, we had very much stricter regulations in terms of what could be aired, in terms of language. Joey Styles, goodness gracious, I'm telling you, that conversation, Joey tells it like it is. I mean, 
but not the way it would have been told <laughs> back when, when I was doing it with all the regulations that we had. I love working with Joey and told him that I, I'd be looking forward the next time that I get a chance to work with him. But um, it, 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 it was totally different then. Jerry came into it and he really had life and vision and, and all of that and a lot of the programs that, that he did. Another you know, absolutely uh, fantastic angle that you're a part of is the entire uh, Andy Kaufman, Jerry Lawler yeah. series. Yeah, yeah, right. And you even were uh, in the actual movie when they recreated it. Well, that's true. That was, uh, Jerry was talking to Milo's foreman, I guess it was, who was the director of the of picture. And uh, he, he was just talking about wrestling in general. And, and um, Lawler mentioned uh, that I was still alive, <laughs> which seemed incredible to me, Lowe's Foreman. Now, to me, that doesn't seem so incredible, but I'm very thankful it was true. Anyhow, and he said, do you suppose you could get him? And, and so Jerry asked me, would you like to, uh, like to do a bit part in that Jim Carrey movie? They're going to they're do Andy's life, and you do the ring announcing as you did here. I said, whoa, man, you bet. When do I go? When do I go? So that's how that came about and uh, went out and just had a ball. It was fascinating, all of that to see. But it was no more fascinating than it was to, uh, to be around Andy Kaufman. He just, he was a very unusual guy and he, he, had, uh, he had some special things like his meditation period before the matches in there that uh, he, he, he would go in a room and he would lock it and nobody came in to, to bother him before his medita meditation period, which was generally 45 minutes to an hour, was going on. And, and, uh, the, and the night that he came to the Coliseum, and that was the night, the first night that he, had, he agreed to get in the ring with Jerry Lawler, because originally it was only women, because I think everybody knows the story that he used that in his nightclub act and that whole deal, and that's the way it was supposed to be uh, in Memphis, and that's the way it was. And, and uh, I thought it was pretty ambitious of, of uh, Andy to, to come in there, and he took on some women that he did not know. I mean, you know, they were, they were just women that they had picked, and he took and got in there and wrestled with them, and, and all of that, and, and um, so Andy, when he agreed to get in there with Jerry Lawler, uh, George Shapiro, who was Andy's manager, and you see his name always, if you look at the Seinfeld show, you'll see one of the executive producers was uh, George Shapiro, and he, can't, he was going crazy. He was doing his best trying to talk Andy out. He could see. Here's a star of Taxi, you know, and making this big time money, and he could see the meal ticket. Pardon me, George, if it sounds the way it sounds, but uh, I mean that's the way it struck me back then. From this point, he just, I mean, he could see his meal ticket and and going out, and he was feeling sorry for for Andy. He didn't want him to get in there and just accidentally something happened, and uh, so it was kind of an exciting time. At, at that time, people remember the uh, the stuff that they saw in Letterman and the and, and oh, yeah. big matches with yeah. Lar. But but uh, even after that, Kauf, Kaufman stayed around Memphis because he I guess because yes, he, he, he loved wrestling so much that he they stayed involved and they did uh, an angle with Jimmy Hart. Can you can you lead us more into? Are you kidding me? What an angle that was! That's one of the things, and that's I guess we sit when I say we, my wife and I would sit down and look at when they run back old footage and all, and that time when Jimmy and Andy got into it, and, and, and I tried to step in between them, you know, well, it was the blind leading the blind in there. I didn't know what was going to happen, except I was, this was on a, a, a television that, that showed a lot of responsibility, and uh, we were on the Scripps Howard station at that time, in Memphis, and we were trying to break up the fight. And when I look and see these guys and them swinging and Andy with those wild <laughs> swings, 
Oh, man, <laughs> it was priceless. It it was really something. Would you say that uh, you know Andy ever became like one of the one of the boys, or was he? O did he always keep his own distance? Well, he he did consider himself one of the boys, and you know what intrigued him was, and I think it told it in the movie probably. But one of the things that intrigued Andy, he used to lay up there in his room when he was a kid growing up, and he would see all of the heels and the baby faces come out and the heels would go out and just by putting their hands up like that they'd get the crowd going boo you know and then the yay and all that he just was so enthralled by the fact that the enthusiasm that these wrestlers would show was picked up by the fans and it would be fed back to him he thought that was the greatest thing that happened I'm telling you he did and that and, and and when he got down there in Memphis, now you bear in mind, he had been doing this in nightclubs and little bitty old things, you know, with halfway. He came down there and I mean we were playing hello every week, ten thousand plus people at that Mid South Coliseum to see this guy in there with whomever it may be, Foxy who was one of the toughest gals he ever tried to get in there with, or whoever it was, or when Lawler, and he got to the point where he'd do that prancing around the ring, you know, and he would go like that and do a little pose up there of a thing, and the crowd, boo! <laughs> they would start this blowout booing of him, and he just absolutely, he thought he had died and gone to him. He loved it. Now, that's pure and simple. That's the way he felt about it. He did feel like one of the boys. Did you feel like the movie that they, they did, The Man on the Moon, was a very accurate portrayal of that time in Memphis? Well, there were some things. I, you know, I, I don't know why I got the impression to the whole movie when I looked at it. I just kind of got the impression that uh, it was some of the stuff got convoluted in there and nobody got as clear a picture. Actually, when I went out there, the only thing that I knew was Andy Kaufman's life in wrestling. Uh, he, he had a life that entailed, I found out from that movie, a whole lot more things than I knew were going on with him. And uh, so I, I didn't think that there was enough in the movie that portrayed accurately the intensity that he had. They said it and they did it and all of that, and it was good. But um, I don't know. I don't know what the reason was, but apparently, from what I heard, they didn't. Uh, the, 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 the fans didn't really go to it in droves. It was not successfully anywhere near as successful as they thought the movie was going to be. Now, that's just what I'd heard. Now, my information may have been incorrect. But. There was a, on you know on the internet and in the, in the tabloid sheets the uh, there was there was a report that Jerry Lawler actually struck Jim Carrey uh, backstage because Jim Carrey was kind of egging him on. I don't know if you were ever on set or if you saw that or if you knew that was just trying to no, create publicity. No, I did not see that. Did you ever even hear about that? No, uh, I never did really. Okay. Um, it, it it was I was I, I want to tell you, I was absolutely astounded when Lawler did that pile driver on Kaufman. I mean, you know, you've been around wrestling, you know that is, that's nothing to play with. Right. I mean, you can really have some difficulties in a hurry if both participants aren't on the same page with that. And, and I was kind of astounded at that. And, but I'll, I'll tell you one thing for a fact, you're talking about Andy staying around Memphis, and he did. And he wore that collar until it was about to walk away. I mean, right. He really got into that collar part. He loved that bit. Yeah, he felt like one of the boys. He really did. Uh, last week, uh, T Terry Funk was asked about his empty arena match. And uh, oh. he said that he said he thought the, uh, the whole thing was pretty awful until he said that you really, your call on the whole thing really made it and gave the legs that it has today that people are still talking about it. Well, that was nice of Terry to uh, say that. I got to tell you that it was 
it was the eeriest thing I believe I have ever done in wrestling was to call that thing in an empty coliseum. And it was legit. I mean, in terms of being an empty coliseum, what you saw is what you got. I mean, that's the way it was. And uh, it just, it was just so, you know, because it's, I don't know exactly how to say it, unless it's like playing music without anybody hearing it, nobody there to hear it, you know. You, you don't re have anything to react to. And, and that's the way it was. But Lawler and, and Terry were, they were totally into it, and I couldn't help but be into it. It was just, just a, a magnificent <laughs> idea. Uh, on the front end of it. I'm not sure that it's anything that you, know, you want to do anything like it every week, but uh, it, was, it was just one of those times and one of those places that, that it, was, it was just a special, special thing. Do you remember the, the follow-up to that uh, after that was shown on TV? Do you, rem do you remember anything about the, uh, the live show following that? Because the reason I ask is because Terry couldn't remember if it was a successful... Uh, angle or not. He said he didn't remember it as being particularly successful. You know, I have, that's exactly what I was going to say. I cannot tell you exactly, but I don't, I don't, I certainly won one of their, their most successful promotions. Um, it, it, it wasn't, it was a long way from being a flop because you weren't going to have a flop when you had Terry Funk and Jerry Lawler going at it, uh, and but it was not one of the major successful ones. I want to talk about some of the the names that you know make Memphis wrestling what it is, and yeah. and when I mention these names, if any stories come uh, come to mind or any particular angles that they were involved in that you remember fondly, if you could just expand on those, we've mentioned uh, Jimmy Hart, yeah. also someone that you work with today. Yeah. yeah. Jimmy and I, um, we have worked with each other for a long, long time. I, I'm going to jump fast forward, if I may, from the experiences of when, when Jimmy was a heel manager and uh, I was a babyface announcer and we didn't have much association with each other. I'm telling you, this goes back into the beginning days of it and, and that's the way it was. Let me fast forward to the point where uh, Jimmy and I had done no telling how many shows together. When I said done shows together, Jimmy was managing and I was announcing. And that was the extent of it. I had interviewed Jimmy many times. And, and thanks to Jimmy's persistence, <laughs> his perseverance about getting his face on camera, I interviewed him a lot more times than I really knew I was going to interview him because he'd come busting out there, blah, 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 have something to say about some match coming up or there ought to be a match coming up or whatever it was. But that's the only extent that Jimmy and I were together on it. And, then, and this has just been uh, a couple of three years or so ago uh, I went up to do, it's when they were periodically, Corey Macklin, who was promoting in Memphis, and, and Corey uh, asked me to, if I would come up there and do some shows with him. Yeah, went up there to do a show, and I, and, I, and I was doing two shows. One of them, as they did all the time, a live show, and the next one was a tape show. Well, we did the live show, and, and the young man that was, Working as, uh, this was after Dave Brown, uh, who was, is, and was and is uh, still uh, at the Scripps Howard. I don't think they own it anymore. Well, maybe they do. Anyhow, uh, Dave Brown, and it, it was after that. And so I was working with uh, Brian Teglin, who currently does a show with Corey Macklin. We did the first show together, Bing. Nobody bothered to tell Brian that, I was going to stay there and was going to do the second show, uh, do a second show. Brian didn't know it, and so he left. And right at the last minute, I went out to get on set, and, right, and there was nobody showing up. Where's Brian? He's gone. Nobody told him he was supposed to stay, I think, is, is, is what happened. And all of a sudden, right before we went on the air, here comes breathless 
the mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart out there, hey, they asked me to come out and sit down and do the show with you. I said, sit down, let's do the show. That's the first time Jimmy and I had ever worked as an announcing team together. And it was, it was, it was thrilling to me because we had never, other than just doing the interviews and all, like we're doing right here, uh, we had never had done anything like this together where we, where we worked together on the same. And it was so unusual to be talking at, to Jimmy as an equal and a friend which this is not the way that Jimmy and I had had a relationship on camera for all of those years. Turned out to be something great. Now, going back with Jimmy, yeah, this guy has, you know, he just, he just thoroughly thinks a lot of things through, and, and he's tough. He's good in what he does, absolutely good in what he does, and he has, he has a spirit and an invigoration that he can invigorate anybody with that spirit too. When when Jimmy gets talking to you, you feel better, and uh, that's the kind of guy he was to work with, and he is to work with. So wasn't all pleasant, but uh, you know, hey, majority of it was. How about uh, Jerry Lawler? Jerry Lawler, I I know you know I have to be careful about this, but. I knew Jerry better, I, I know Jerry better than I do any other wrestler in the world. <laughs> and Jerry and I have just known, I knew Jerry ever since he was 15 years old. And the way he got into wrestling was he, I don't know how many people, I think most people by now know that Lawler has a fantastic art ability. He is a really an outstanding artist. I'm not talking about a cartoonist. I'm talking about pure, unadulterated artist, and he loves art. And uh, he, he went to what was then Memphis State, is now the University of Memphis, on an art scholarship, as a matter of fact. And uh, Jerry, when he was 15 years old, started to, uh, he watched wrestling. His dad was a big wrestling fan all the time, and his dad, um, a, used to take Jerry down to the uh, Memphis Auditorium. That was in the old days when it was downtown Memphis and, and uh, rather than the Mid-South Coliseum. And so Jimmy would sit down, he would do the matches. What he'd do is just make little sketches and then he'd go home and he'd draw what happened on, on the matches. And one week he sent in these drawings his dad sent the drawings and said, thought you'd get a kick out of this. and all. I didn't know him, didn't know his dad, didn't know any, anything about him. And so, good night, that is amazing. And he would draw Tojo Yamamoto or whoever it was, Sala Wanger off, the bad German manager, whoever it was. And, and, and he would send in these little cartoon things with the, on which I would tell the end result of the, this is what happened down in the Memphis Auditorium this week and all that. I thought, man, that is great. So I called the house and I got a hold of Jerry's dad and I asked him if he would bring him up there. I thought the fans would get a real kick out of seeing him. So well, we arranged and Jerry talks about how his dad went out and, and got him a new suit to wear and come up there. <laughs> he came to the studio and I put him on there and, and Lawler's just one of those guys who's a natural. I mean, he's a guy who could talk when he was 15 years old and scared to death. He, he, he still, he, he, he'll tell you he didn't, but he was particularly good. And we'd sit there and talk about him drawing and all that stuff. And it became a regular thing and a feature of the wrestling show that we had in Memphis that Jerry would do these cartoons and we'd show it all. And so that's how I got to know Jerry Young. And I saw him grow up in the business in the very beginning and bango, he was a star. He became a star in Memphis and still is a star in Memphis to this very day. Uh, Lawler is one of the most complete and competent wrestlers that I know. He absolutely is. And I've worked with a lot of good ones. And that doesn't mean they aren't good. And there aren't some other great wrestlers around. But Lawler had an ability to throw punches that look like they 
absolutely were tearing a guy's head off and still do, and sometimes they almost did when he, when he, when he just missed that fraction, you know. And, and, um, and he's just that good. That's all I can tell you.